Hit it, hit it. The president wants to spy on 200 million Americans without a warrant. Has he read this document which he was sworn to uphold? Now, I will not have you libel Abraham Lincoln. I don't understand the problem with registering guns. We register cars. Mark Levine brings you the news the government doesn't want you to know. Today, an explosive story about connections between white supremacists and Islamic terrorists. When there's a conflict between Scalia's conservative values and the Constitution of the United States, he throws away the Constitution. When we do have secret prisons, that is not what America is all about. Let's go to Mark in five, four, three, two. Good evening, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. The Super Committee failed. I say, so what? I'm going to talk about that and other issues with my guest tonight. He is Mike Lane, a Republican strategist in Northern Virginia. Mike, welcome again to the Inside Scoop. Mark, thank you very much for having me. First off, let me apologize to our audience for my rather informal attire tonight. Uh, I'm just returning from uh, Thanksgiving, where I uh, uh, participated in really good family values. And uh, well, this I, is, this, I hope this you is had a wonderful have. Thanksgiving. Well, thank you so much, and I hope our audience and you had one too. Yes. Um, so the super committee failed just before Thanksgiving. Uh, they had set it up, of course. They were six Democrats, six Republicans. In order for the Republicans to agree to increase the debt ceiling, something they did oh all the time under George W. Bush, practically every year, sometimes twice a year. But they said, Obama, we're not going to do it for you. But in return for increasing the debt ceiling, uh, the parties agreed to put themselves in a straitjacket, supposedly. And the straitjacket works something like this. January 2013 comes around. Uh, the elections are over. Uh, there's either uh, President Obama reelected or lame duck President Obama either way. And suddenly, automatic cuts come in January 2013, half out of domestic programs that don't include the poor, and half out of military programs for a total of $1.2 trillion. Uh, that was supposed to be the dagger that got the Super Committee to act. President Obama issued his own proposal of about $4 trillion. The Republicans refused to raise taxes on the rich. Uh, the Democrats offered some entitlement cuts, but not as many as the Republicans wanted because the Democrats wanted to raise taxes on the rich uh, back to the same levels they've been for the last 50 years rather than the abnormally low levels they are now. And the whole thing fell apart. And I got to say, first of all, I predicted it would fall apart. I'm proud of my prediction. I can't sound the only one who predicted it would fall apart. And secondly, I'm just fine with it. What are, what's your thought? Well. I don't know that I'm fine with it, but I'm certainly not uh, broken up about it. Uh, I, th I think you've laid it out exactly correctly uh, what the uh, what, what the rules of the game were, what the stakes were. Uh, but there's a few things that we have to consider now that we're in that uh, particular uh, way. First is uh, the Republicans offered 250 billion dollars in tax increases, uh, which were rejected out of hand by the Democrats in uh, the Super Committee. Uh, as being insufficient. Well, I, you know, I mean, a $250 billion tax increase ought to be the basis for discussion, but it wasn't. Uh, the second and more intriguing thing to me uh, is what does Secretary Panetta do uh, at this time, Defense Secretary Panetta? Uh, he is on record uh, fairly strongly and fairly articulately as saying that this uh, arbitrary across the board cut of $600 billion in defense is essentially Armageddon uh, for the Defense Department. He has a list of things uh, that are not going to get done. Uh, he has said that this is going to essentially gut defense and, and make it impossible uh, for us to meet our obligations, uh, et cetera. And, and after he says that, the president comes out and says he will veto any changes uh, to the defense cuts because the whole point was they were supposed to hurt. Uh, I wonder what Secretary Panetta's future is going to be. Well, I have lots of responses to what you have to say. Let me start, before we get to defense and all of that, with uh, the so-called $250 billion in tax increases that the Republicans supposedly offered on the table. Let's talk about the details. What they plan to do is raise $250 billion on the middle class. They were going to get rid of the mortgage interest deduction completely, not for second homes, but for all homes, including your first home. Uh, they were going to get rid of all the deductions that middle class uh, people get, to things like uh, medical care, things like that. Uh, and in return, because they were going to raise, oh, maybe uh, probably a trillion dollars in raising taxes on the middle class, they were going to give the rich a further tax cut from where they were now. They're going to take the, in the individual rates, the ones that now are about 35 percent, and lower them. I, some proposals said 30. I even heard 25 percent. So the idea was it was not a tax increase. Uh, uh, it was a massive transfer of wealth 
from the poor to the rich, who, need I remind you, are already richer at any time they've been since the 1920s. There's massive income inequality. And what they were going to do is raise tax on the middle class and give that money to the rich. That's a non-starter with Democrats. Mark, first of all, I don't begrudge anybody who's successful and uh, makes themselves an economic pie that is uh, fairly substantial. That's not something we should uh, envy. That's something we should emulate. Uh, the second thing is uh, it may or may not be desirable to have a, uh, a wide gap or disparity or whatever it is, but it's not the government's responsibility to, uh, to, to take from uh, uh, the the rich and and give it to people who have not been successful in life. That, that's not the function of government. The really? Function of Should government, anyone pay for government? Uh, the, the function. Someone's got to pay for government, the, right? The, the function of government is to well, uh, and, and every, someone has to pay for it. Everybody should pay for government. Okay, so everybody. the question is, should homeless people pay more, or should Warren Buffett pay more? Um, I think, everyone, and, I, and I don't begrudge Warren Buffett his 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 millions and billions. I think he's been very successful. Warren Buffett has said, in fact, and Bill Gates has said the same thing that they need to pay more taxes. I agree with Warren Buffett. I think he's a patriotic billionaire who wants to, he believes that people of his class have made oodles of money that they don't need and that they can use to pay for the government. You happen to believe, I guess, that middle class people struggling to even buy toys for their kids at Christmas, they should carry the weight and Warren Buffett oh. should not. The question is not make successful people pay. You agree that someone has to pay. The question is not whether rich people should pay, but who should pay? And I don't believe that decreasing the burden on the rich, which need I remind you, under Eisenhower was at 90 percent, under Kennedy at 70 percent, under Reagan at 50 percent, under Bill Clinton at 39 percent, it's now at 35 percent, increasing it to a level it has not seen since the 1920s, making sure the rich richer than they ever have before, and instead raising taxes on the American people, the 99 percent, the people, frankly, who are the only people who are going to make this economy go. Frankly, we need Black Friday very badly, and it worked out well because people are going to debt, buying toys for Christmas. It doesn't help the economy, and it doesn't make sense. To me, it's kind of like saying, well, everyone should pay for our military, so we're not only going to draft the able-bodied, we're going to draft the disabled, we're going to draft the elderly, we're going to draft children. Well, let's face it, able-bodied people in their 30s are more able to serve in the military than 85-year-old women and, and four-year-old boys. And so we, we, we allow people in the military who are able to do the job. The same thing is true with paying taxes. Someone has to pay it and the rich should pay more. And here are the facts. Uh, the bottom 50% pay not a dime in uh, income taxes. Not a dime, the bottom 50%. In federal income taxes. Federal they income pay taxes. state income taxes, not, payroll taxes, right. sales taxes. Not, not they a pay a lot of other taxes. Not a dime in federal income taxes, the lower 50%. The top 1% that we've heard so much about lately, uh, they pay 80%. Uh, so, they don't pay 80%. Uh, that, that's an exaggeration. I, 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 they they pay 68 percent. I think it's you know, something like that. 68 percent. All right. The, the point is, no, uh, where about anyway, the only about the only thing we're going to agree on here is that that's unfair. Uh, I think it's unfair, and you think it's unfair, and we have a different perspective on that. But the but but the but when the it comes to this, tax rates, you but, can't deny but, this is the lowest, the, the best the rich have had since the 1920s. Because under Republicans, Eisenhower and I Nixon say, and Ford and even Ronald Reagan, your big fan Ronald Reagan, uh, they 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 had. A, a higher tax rate. It's I would the say, tax rate I would say it's the best push. Americans have had in a long time. No, only the uh, rich. And we, no, uh, the, the lower 50% that pay absolutely not a dime have never had it this good. That's true, too. Uh, so every, so everyone's, I would say, everyone's never had it this good since the 1920s. So, but uh, the problem is that we, we spend too much. We don't have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. If we can get a handle on spending, uh, then we'll be able to uh, reduce the deficit and balance the budget, which apparently... Uh, according to Dick Durbin on yesterday's Meet the Press, uh, the Democrats don't have any particular interest in doing so. But you know uh, what? Our spending hasn't changed that much over the last uh, couple decades. It did go up. We, we, we spent on a couple wars. Uh, you may recall when George W. Bush went to war in, in Iraq, which I did not support, and in Afghanistan, which I did. Either way, I said, he wants to go to war. Let's tax the American people to pay for it. We taxed the American people to pay for it. the revolution, the War of 1812, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, Korea and Vietnam, every other war, significant war, America has fought. We raised taxes to pay for it, except this one. George W. Bush put it on the credit card. Now, it seems to me that when the rich people of America are paying less taxes than they have at any time since the 1920s, that it seems to me if we're going to go to war, and, you, and I know you supported those war, someone has to pay for it. And when the middle class is struggling, and I don't think you can deny the middle class is struggling right now in America, 
Why would you make them pay for the war that George Bush wanted to fight rather than making the people who could afford to pay for the war pay for it? Well, you know, here's, here's, here's the facts on the whole thing. Uh, yes, we had a good Black Friday, and yes, hopefully that's, that's going to be good. And hopefully that's a signal uh, that the economy is picking up, although I think the signals are so uneven that we, we can't conclude that. I'm more worried about Europe, uh, frankly. At, at this, I think they're bringing oh, us down. The, the, most un, the most underreported story and the under, most underappreciated story. Right. Let's do a show on that coming up. Anyway. Uh, the, the the simple fact of the matter is that uh, we need everybody to pay their fair share. Uh, we now have, you, you said that we don't spend that much more, uh, the average uh, of spending, uh, government spending over the last X years uh, is between 17 and 19 percent of gross domestic product. We are now at 24 percent of gross domestic product. That means it's up at a minimum 5 percent worst case scenario, uh, 7 percent, but that's above the number in, in gross terms, uh, aggregate terms. The reality is spending's up 33 percent since the president, uh, uh, you know, started. Uh, Not since Obama uh, took office because well, it was at the same level in 2008 Mark, under George Bush. Mark, getting, getting, it's because of recession. Get, getting, getting back to the super committee. Uh, we have $15 trillion in debt. We just last week passed $15 trillion in debt. We are running trillion and a half deficits every year. The super committee was asked to come up with a trillion two in deficit reduction over 10 years, and they couldn't do it. The, th this is exactly what our founding fathers intended. When you can't get together, when you can't compromise, let the next election resolve where we are. Absolutely. And I think you're happy and I'm happy going into the next election with our respective positions. And I, let me tell you why I'm happy. The dirty little secret for Democrats is we have you Republicans over a barrel, and I'll tell you why. You get worried about a $15 trillion debt? Easy solution. Come 2013, if the president and the Congress do nothing, and let's face it, I think it's very unlikely that it's going to be 60 Republicans in the Senate. I think it's very unlikely there's going to be 60 Democrats in the Senate. Right. I, I think you and I can agree that both those scenarios are extremely unlikely. There'll probably be 50-something of one party or another. And because of the Republican rule that everything is going to be filibustered, you, can, you can't you can actually do anything you want in Washington, but you can stop anything you don't want in Washington. Which, well, is, if, the way our, which is the way our founding fathers intended fine. it to be. If we do nothing... What happens when 2013 rolls around? The Bush tax cuts expire, and $6 trillion over the next 10 years rolls in. The Cooper Committee couldn't handle $1.2 trillion. But with the Bush tax cuts expiring, suddenly we don't have a deficit issue anymore. And if the Republicans won't negotiate with the Democrats, that automatic trigger is going to be a lot more deadly than the automatic trigger for the Super Committee. I know you want to respond, and I'll give you a chance. And you may want to respond as well. All you have to do is dial 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275. We'll be right back after this. I need a job. Speak English better. Me gustaría hablar inglés mejor. I want to be a U.S. citizen. Quisiera ser ciudadano de los Estados Unidos. For over 35 years. Por más de 35 años. The Hispanic Committee of Virginia has been serving our community. El Comité Hispano de Virginia ha estado sirviendo a nuestra comunidad. Job training and placement. Capacitación. Ayuda para conseguir trabajo. Education for children and adults. Educación para niños y adultos. Immigration, naturalization, and medical referrals. Ayuda para los procesos de inmigración y naturalización. Y orientación sobre médicos are a small part of what we do. Son solo una pequeña parte de lo que hacemos. For help, information, or to volunteer. Para ayuda, información, o para ofrecerse como voluntario. Contact the Hispanic Committee of Virginia. Comuníquese con el Comité Hispano de Virginia. Helping everyone participate more fully in American society. Ayudando a todos a participar plenamente en la sociedad norteamericana. Did you notice if you were missing half your kidney function? According to the National Kidney Foundation, 20 million people have chronic kidney disease and 20 million more may be at risk and not even know it. Anyone with high blood pressure, diabetes, or family history of chronic kidney disease is at risk. Early diagnosis is vitally important. 
To get the whole story, talk to your doctor and visit the National Kidney Foundation at kidney.org or call for a free brochure. Because when it comes to chronic kidney disease, you might not know the half. Here again, the Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. The Super Committee failed, and I say, so what? For Democrats, we know that the Bush tax cuts are going to expire come January 2013. And while everyone's talking about the daggers hanging over the head of Congress, that they're going to cut $600 billion in defense and $600 billion in social programs, what nobody is talking about is a much, much larger number, namely six trillion dollars or 10 times five times the amount that the super committee was working on is going to come in if we simply allow the bush tax cuts to expire now i like most democrats would like to see them expire on the wealthy and i like to keep them for the middle class the rich uh excuse me the republican party kind of the same difference uh, the republican party wants to keep them for the rich and raise taxes on the middle class because both parties disagree, and because we're not going to have 60 Republicans or 60 Democrats come 2012, I think the Bush tax cuts are going to expire. And if you're worried about America's fiscal health, that will be a major, major benefit to America's fiscal health. may not help the economy so much, but it's a lot bigger than anything to worry about with the Super Committee, and it's the part that nobody's talking about. Mike Lane, Republican strategist, I give you, you have a long opportunity. Tell well, me why I'm wrong. Uh, well, I mean, even President Obama says that a weak economy is no time to raise taxes. Uh, it, was pre it was President Obama who went to the Congress and said, I want to renew the Bush tax cuts uh, last um, uh, lame duck session. To be specific, so, he wanted to renew them on those that are in the bottom 98%. He, he, he didn't he, want to no, re he, renew them on the he, top 2%. He, he, he wanted to renew. He, the, the deal he cut was that he it, would renew it, the it entire a, thing, and he signed it into law. It was so, a compromise. So President Obama is on record as saying he does not want to take this money out of the economy. He no. wants to keep it in the economy. Well, wait, wait, wait. Uh, just, where, just where, to be fair about what happened in the past, President Obama said he would prefer to keep the Bush tax cuts for the 98% the of us, and to only raise taxes on the top 2%. The Republicans said, unless you agree to let the rich keep their tax cuts, we're going to raise taxes on everybody, and they came to a compromise, which is well, they would keep everybody's taxes the, low. No, the that wasn't Obama's first no, choice. No, no, the, the Republicans didn't say they were going to raise taxes on anybody. What they said was uh, the same thing that you said, which was good luck passing it unless we have a compromise. Right. Now, so if, now next if we year, did nothing, right, taxes now, now, up now, everybody. Now next year, once the Republicans take over the Senate, if you think the Democrats' best strategy is just looking at the Republicans say, good luck passing anything, well, you know, we're, we're perfectly willing to take that into the 2014 elections. I think uh, they should filibuster I think that, it. Uh, well, it, it, I think they should know, filibuster it how, because... Let me, let me ask you this. They should offer the alternative proposal. Was, was there a major tax increase in 2009? No, there were tax decreases in 2009. Was there a major tax increase in 2009 no. associated with health care? No, I, that the, doesn't there come were no, into effect okay. until 2014, but, I believe, but, but, it was, but it was enacted in 2009, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, with 41 Republicans uh, filibustering, correct? Uh, well, actually, 40. It was it was tricky. It, it, but by the it, time it, it, by the time they got to it, they had uh, they had to use every 60th Democrat. They had to use Ben Nelson too. No, so only no, because actually, of Democrats had 60. Actually, they didn't do it that way. Um, sure, you, they did. They used you, reconciliation. No, exactly. And what does reconciliation well, that require? That only requires 50. What is 50, right. But, they, exactly. but in order to pass the pieces that included the tax part that you're talking about, they no, needed 60. They passed it in reconciliation was where they passed it. They, so, it, it it's, it's, it's confusing because it's two bills put together. But part was passed, required 60 votes and to get over the filibuster, mm -hmm. and then part was passed in reconciliation. But, but the Republicans had 41 votes, and you didn't get uh, a Republican on that. Uh, so what we have is a precedent that the Democrats have set, uh, which is that you know if we can't use the rules of the Senate one way, we're going to use the rules of the Senate the other way. Well, wait, if we're going to go through that, reconciliation. No, wait a minute. This no. is very interesting to me, because yeah. what you seem to be saying is that a majority can pass tax increases, and what, that you don't need I'm, 60. If that's true, what then the Democrats here, right now and, and frankly, they could have a year or two ago have passed a bill to raise the taxes back on the top 2% to the same levels they were in the Bill Clinton years, and they didn't need Republicans. They could do well, it on a reconciliation. They, Are you saying they could have done that? I, I'm saying they did do it, uh, not on the Bush tax cuts, but uh, they can't do it now because they don't have a, a Democratic House. No, but uh, you're there saying... Is, no, there, there, there is a safeguard for the American people called the Republican but, House. But you're saying that under 2009-2010, right. that the Democrats, if they had wanted to, could have raised the taxes 
on the, the wealthy, back to levels they were under Bill Clinton, where we had very good economic times, I remind you, and a surplus, that they could have done that without any Republican votes. They could have. They didn't because they didn't have the votes in the House. The, there were too many. There were too many. They had uh, there, Nancy there were, Pelosi could there, have gotten there, those there votes. There were too in the many House. blue dog Democrats that would not have gone along with it in the House. I think they didn't do it because of they, because of, of the filibuster. Oh, I, we'll I mean, I recall having votes in the Senate, particularly on this, and they didn't use reconciliation uh, for it. I admit reconciliation Pelosi, rules are very complicated. P P Pelosi did not put that to a vote in the House and send it to the Senate. She did not do it. Why? That's because true, she but the, couldn't why, get it through why, the House. Why? Because the Senate failed. You know, unlike the House now, which has sent. Uh, literally 23 major job pieces of legislation over jobs, to the Senate jobs. Uh, that that the Senate refuses to vote on. Nancy Pelosi never even put it to a vote in the House. Here's how a Republican Senate. jobs bill works. You take the homeless and you take their clothes off them and you take their food away from them and you take the middle class, you take away their cars, you take away their houses and you pile it all at the foot of Mitt Romney or Warren Buffett or some other billionaire. You pile all the, all the stuff that everyone else owns at their feet and you say, go, trickle down, give us some no. back. Mark, the That's a Republican job. The, the, fir the first thing you do is reduce regulation. Now, even the president has seen... What regulation his, concerns you? Well, uh, most of what's coming out of the EPA not only concerns me, but obviously concerns the president since he's signing executive orders left and right to stop EPA from doing everything Mike, they want to do. You're it's not, his administration, and he's stopping them. You're not really suggesting that the Environmental Protection Agency plays a significant role in our current economic troubles. I'm telling the, you that the, it is the, a job killer the in our current economic the Begun by, by Republican Richard Nixon, the president continued believes, by Republican Gerald Ford, supported by, you know, I mean, Reagan had the I, EPA, Bush not, had the EPA, and, and did Obama I'm enact not, some new regulation I'm, that's I'm really not, concerning you? I'm not advocating uh, elimination of the EPA. What? I'm saying President Obama has seen how reckless the EPA is behaving. And he has signed executive orders stopping them then in their tracks. Then you should from approve doing what of what doing. President Obama is doing. I approve of and, that tremendously. And vote for him for re-election. I absolutely approve of that. I'm glad he, to hear we have your support. He, he gets. He, <laughs> He, he gets 20, I'm, Mark, he gets 20% of it right. He I'm, really does. I'm glad to hear that we have your support. But but when Republicans throw out these mantras, and I know them, I've heard them, you know, if you just cut regulation, it, it's a jobs bill. Regulation, Giving sorry. money to, to Uncle Scrooge is a jobs bill and taking it from Tiny Tim. It's a jobs bill. That's not a jobs bill. It's taking from the poor, giving to the rich. It's reverse Robin Hood. At least call it what it is. What new regulation? If regulations are the real reason this economy is down in the dumps, I don't, I don't think you believe that. But oh, if it I is, do. I do. Okay, give me an right. example. Give, More, me, give, give me five regulations right. that are new under Obama the first, the first that are thing, killing the, business. The first thing we, well, uh, his, give me his, one. His, his refusal to approve new offshore drilling. That number, that that's a huge job killer. Now wait a minute. His, his exec, was it approved under Bush? His executive order, yes. Uh, his executive order, uh, which, uh, which essentially stopped the uh, pipeline uh, in its tracks from Canada down to the Gulf. Uh, that's number two. That was 25,000 jobs that he, he stopped with one stroke of the pen. Uh, and, and how right many there. hundreds of thousands of jobs do we lose in gas stations across the country? I mean, you know, I mean, it, and also uh, the, the dirty oil, the shale oil from Canada. Look, you can agree or disagree with whatever the EPA is doing. But you can't say that that our economy is in trouble because of this. The, the pipeline's a new idea. Look, we, we, the, 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 the economy needs help. It doesn't need hindrance. Okay. The Obama administration's regulatory policy is hindering it, and the president, to his credit, has seen that on numerous occasions and signed executive orders stopping his own regulators dead in their tracks telling them, no, don't do it, you're killing jobs. But, but, I think it's great. But it's not the regulations that are killing jobs. i, I got to tell you, the Republicans Mark, say when regulations you, when kill when jobs. You, when you They've take been money saying out of that the for economy. the last 40 when years. When you take money out of the economy, you've killed jobs. When you take money out of the economy, you've killed jobs. You know what? I agree with you, which is why I think when you take the money from Joe and Mary middle class, who are looking at maybe whether they can afford a second car because of their two jobs, and they don't have the money anymore because Republicans raise taxes on them, and you give that money well, to Mitt Romney, who doesn't need it and doesn't want it, you're right, that kills jobs. How about Let's talk about specific how, tax how, job how, killer. How about there are no tax increases the Republicans have advocated or supported? Sure they do. But, I'll give you one but, right now. But let's talk about a $2,000 increase in the cost of the car that makes it unaffordable for Joe and Mary because the EPA has mandated X, Y, and Z you want, on it. You want to know a tax increase Republicans support right now? It's called the payroll tax, right? President Obama reduced the payroll think, tax I, I don't think from, from 6% to 4%. And he has said, you know, if you don't like any part of my Jobs Act, 
at least allow the payroll tax to stay low. He said exactly what you said. Raising ta well, not exactly. You said raising taxes on anyone hurts the economy. What President Obama has said is raising taxes on the middle class hurts the economy. They're the consumers. They're the people who buy on Black Friday. Let's face it, con consumer consumption from middle class people is 70 plus percent of the nation's economy. Europe and all our exports is maybe 10 or 15 percent. It's the American consumer that runs the economy and what President Obama has said, if you raise payroll taxes on them, that is going to hurt the economy. And one of the Republicans said, we can't afford it. We can't afford it. They actually support a tax increase. Now, I think you don't, but your party should. Well, does. you know, let, let me say I don't think there's a party position on this yet. I think there are some Republicans who have spoken unfavorably about it. Uh, there are some Republicans in, uh, in you know, let's, let's call them uh, uh, high profile uh, that have spoken negatively about it. Mike, it doesn't uh, problem, take much, no, right? No, no, I, mean, no, no. I mean, all the Democrats no. support it. Hang it would on. take 10% of your party. Here, here's, here's the problem. Uh, when, when, you, when you slow down or when you reduce uh, the Social Security tax, uh, that doesn't get made up with general revenues. You are, you are hurting the Social Security Trust Fund. Al Gore and his lockbox are rolling over in their grave every time the, the president says he wants to damage the trust fund uh, by not funding it uh, to the full level. Notwithstanding the fact that you're hurting Social Security and, and speeding up the demise of Social Security by doing this, it does have some economic benefits. And I don't think you're being fair by saying the Republican Party or all Republicans uh, are not supporting this. I won't say all, uh, but it, I, I'll say this. It's by no means a, a monolithic position. I'll say this. It would only take 10 to 20 percent of your party to support this in both the House and the Senate for it to become law. Obama supports it. And every Democrat, I guarantee you, in the House and the Senate would vote to continue that payroll tax to be reduced. So what do we need? Maybe 20 of 200 Republicans in the House, that's 10 percent. We need maybe um, seven Republicans out of 47 to stop a filibuster. That's what, uh, right. do my math, that's maybe 20 percent. If 10 to 20 percent of your party supported this, okay. it would become here's, law. Here's, so clearly, whatever support there is for it in your party, it doesn't even rise to the 10 to 20 percent that we need to make this law. Here, here's what you need to, uh, um, to, to to get Republican support on this, and you'll have overwhelming Republican support on this. You'll have almost Let me guess, the guess, reduce taxes votes. on the rich. No. No? No. Don't increase taxes on the rich. As you know... It's a separate proposal. A, as, as you know... No, it's not. To, to get this through, it has to be revenue neutral. Why? And And... Because those are the rules of the Senate. It has to be revenue neutral. No, those no, are the rules not. of the Senate. But George Bush so, did two wars that weren't revenue neutral. Who said, look, the Democrats, when they came in power, said, we are fiscal conservatives. We want everything to be revenue neutral. And the Republicans I'm, said, screw that. No, no, and they spent I, actually, $10 trillion. Actually, Why now, in the midst of a recession, do we have to be revenue that, neutral? That's very funny. For the last two years, the Democrats have ignored the rules of the Senate and, and done things that were Just not like revenue neutral. Just like George Bush did for the but eight the years rules, before. But the rules of the Senate say it needs to be revenue neutral. So in order to make up for this payroll tax cut um, that is not the worst thing in the world. It's not good, but it's not the worst thing in the world. In order to make up for it, they want to increase taxes with class warfare on the rich. We, we, we have, Fund we, it we, some we other way, and you'll have almost unanimous support. We have to take a break, but I, I don't think I need to remind you that neither the Bush tax cut nor the Bush wars were revenue neutral. 888-488-MARK. Give us a call. We'll be right back. Art, a universal language an expression of culture, of self. And now, thanks to Empowered Women International, a way for emerging and established immigrant and refugee artists and artisans to find hope to earn a living while enriching the lives of all of us. Empowered Women International, making a better America every day. For more information on Empowered Women International's educational programs or to make a tax-free donation, contact cfripp at aol.com. tell which kids have trouble with their eyesight. But that's not always the case. Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. 
We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. And may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real life signs of childhood vision problems, and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com. A public service message from the Vision Council of America, and reading is fundamental. Here again, the Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, having a really good debate, I think, with the Republican strategist, Mike Lane. And the question, as always, is where's the money coming from? Who do you tax? Who do you spend? Do you cut taxes? Do you cut spending? What I find fascinating and we're going to get on to other topics, I promise. But what I find fascinating is that when the Democrats want to cut taxes, namely the payroll taxes, and Republicans want to raise taxes on the middle class, no one seems to get the narrative. Wait a minute. Democrats are cutting taxes. Republicans are raising taxes. The sad thing is this is how it's always been. This idea that Republicans are tax cutters is ridiculous. Republicans do want to cut taxes if you're a millionaire. They want to cut your taxes. If you have an estate of $10 million, they want to cut your taxes. But if you're making 100000 a year, they want to raise your taxes. If you work for a living and have payroll taxes, social security taxes, they want to raise your taxes. Democrats want to cut your taxes, and I'm looking forward to a 2012 race where this is probably the main issue at hand. My question for you, Mike Lane, is this. Uh, when George Bush wanted to cut taxes on the rich, when George Bush wanted to cut capital gains taxes and estate taxes, when George Bush wanted to spend on a new Medicare program and on two wars and so forth, he didn't say, let's be revenue neutral. No, he blew a hole in the deficit. In fact, a hole so big that he took Bill Clinton's wonderful surplus, which he worked a lot of time to create. In fact, he even used part of it to shore up the Social Security Trust Fund, which you seem to express concern about. He took that wonderful surplus, spent it all, and gave us the, most, the biggest deficit at any time at that time, right? He took from, from the biggest surplus in American history to the biggest deficit in American history in 2008. Now, why did George Bush not have to be revenue neutral, but President Obama does. Explain well, that to me. We, we, we can solve this very easily. I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to tell you that I can do a lot of things, but one thing I can't do is lead the charge in defending President Bush's deficit spending. Case closed. Okay. Well, you know, when it happened, to, to, you know, to be fair, I was very much against it. I, we, we debated I, it many times, and I told you. I was, I, I was never supportive of the deficit spending. I was supportive, perhaps, of some of the things it was spent on, but I was never supportive of best deficit spending. Well, let me just, one more thing I need to respond to, and that is uh, you said that you're worried, Leon Panetta is worried about $600 billion in cuts in defense. I don't think anybody wants this trigger to actually be pulled. I think we both know that an election can change a bunch of things. Uh, in fact, it's interesting to me, I'm not quite sure what date in January 2013 it's pulled. Do you happen to know? I'd be curious to know if it's after January 20th, the inauguration of a new president, or after January 6th, uh, a new Congress. It'll be very interesting uh, because I would think whoever's elected would have a lot of choice in that matter. But it seems to me that if the parties can't agree, suddenly we get $6 trillion when the Bush tax cuts expire, and that's more enough to pay for any defense cuts. So that would solve your problem. Well. Of course, the economy will uh, significantly sag if that happens. Well, I think it will if you raise taxes on the middle class. So, uh, but I'll tell you this. I think we're coming out of it. I do not think we're going to have a double-dip recession. I'm willing to make that prediction. I admit that we are a little bit hostage to events in Europe and even to some extent to events in China, which has an overheated economy and has been calming it down. But I think that the Black Friday suggested that Americans want to, get, want to spend, even if it means going further into debt, and I'd like to see the middle class be strengthened, frankly, and not go further into debt, which is why I think that the rich should pay their fair share. Mark, I'm, I'm, I'm similarly concerned about events in Europe uh, that uh, we don't have a lot of influence on, a lot of control of. I think that uh, you know, certainly in terms of our emergence, or emergence from, the, uh, from the bad economy uh, through export is unlikely to be a driver there, and it, it, it will extend uh, the bad stuff going on. It may even bring us down. We'll see. Uh, I disagree a little bit about China. Uh, I don't think that they are bringing their economy down. I think worldwide events are bringing their economy down. That's, that's probably and, true. Uh, and, I, they, uh, and, you and, know, and, and that does not portend well. Well, it, it, I admit, but I, I don't think we're going to have a double-dip recession. I, I think that Black Friday has shown that Americans can only be kept down for a couple years, and good old consumer spending is going to rise again. I want to move to, uh, we talked about Europe and China, I want to move to a different area of the world, to the Middle East because it's getting a lot of attention lately. The Arab Spring has become an Arab summer and an Arab fall. 
And what's interesting is it's, of course, not just one country. Uh, we have Tunisia had elections that I think were relatively successful. I wish them well. I hope uh, uh, we'll see what happens with them. The Muslim Brotherhood won a plurality, but not the majority. So uh, hopefully they will be a part of the government, but not the controlling force in the government. Uh, and hopefully they'll be more moderate and not, uh, I, mean, I think the Muslim Brotherhood includes more moderate elements and, and less moderate elements, so particularly in Tunisia. Uh, in Yemen, the leader that we supported, a, who was helping us against al-Qaeda but was terrible to his people, Saleh, has, has stepped down. Uh, in Egypt, the people are saying that the military should not stay in charge forever. I think the military tried to do a little one-two and say, oh, uh, you know, your election's not going to mean anything. And the Egyptian people are, have fought back and trying to make sure that the elections, which are held today, will mean something. And I think in the most interesting case, in Syria, we're finally seeing a real reaction, which I've been supporting for some time, where even the Arab League is sanctioning Syria. So let's let's take these one by one, uh, and then I want to get to Iran too. But but pick your country of choice. Where do you, where do you want to start? Well, I think we agree on uh, Tunisia, uh, Yemen. Uh, yes, Sela was a, um, a good strong ally of ours. In fact, and a uh, terrible dictator. Uh, a, a terrible dictator. You don't always uh, have the luxury of choosing your friends. The one that concerns me, uh, Mark, is Egypt. Uh, this, I think, uh, th this is where I think the president unfortunately blew it. Uh, the, uh, the the demonstrators in the streets, the students, uh, the, the kids with no historical perspective, uh, they, they need the instant gratification. You know, military get away. We want the uh, the elected government right now. Uh, the elected government there is going to be in in Egypt. The more extreme elements of the Muslim Brotherhood, I believe. So whereas they think they are uh, they're trading in the military prote protections for a freer society, what they're going to get is a more oppressive society than they had under Mubarak. It's going to become, uh, in my estimation over time, a, uh, another religious theocracy uh, over there. It, it just does not look good. And the president went on national television uh, and urged the military not to stay there and prevent that. He said it's time to let the, 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 the democracy take place. It was not time for that. It was time to ensure that the military could use its influence to minimize and mitigate the influence of the more extreme elements of the Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood, which I believe are, are poised to take over. Well, Mike, we neither of us knows the results of the Egyptian elections. They were held today. It'll be very interesting. We can talk about it in future shows. I know that we both hope for the same thing, which is that the, the secular uh, majority of, of Egypt, and I, I do think the Muslim Brotherhood, while a plurality, is like in Tunisia, a minority. I think we both hope there will be a secular government that truly represents the full length and breadth of the Egyptian people, from the students to the farmers to the poor to the rich to, to everybody involved. And I hope it's certainly not a political theocracy. We both hope for that outcome. But let's go over the history of what happened in Egypt, because I'm not sure what you're asking the president to have done. I just kept his mouth shut yesterday or the day before. Well, but That's let's all. talk about just what happened before yesterday. So, so Mubarak. Well, he, he, he didn't. I mean, you can argue over whether or not uh, you know yanking the rug out from underneath uh, Mubarak was the right or the wrong thing to do. The rug I, was I being there, uh, yanked whether President Obama think, did anything I, or not. I, well, the, uh, I don't the, think President the, Obama. No, no. The, the rug was being moved. Obama yanked it. Uh, so, so. And, and let me tell you why I'm, I'm glad. Not, he... I'm not saying that was a bad idea. I'm not. I'm not saying that was a bad move. I said you can argue either way. But I think two days ago, when he said, you know, uh, you got to get the military out of here, you know, I, I think that was a mistake. Well, let's go through. He the should history. have just kept his mouth let's shut. Let's go through the history. First of all, with Mubarak, I supported the yanking, as it were, because if, if you recall, they, I think it was three weeks or four weeks. It was a very short revolution, and Obama didn't fully yank the rug till maybe the last week. And it seems to me that if he'd not, he would, if he'd not done so, he would have been on the wrong side of history. And the students who, at this point, are, well, they're somewhat anti-American because we supported Mubarak, but they're not fully anti-American. They're pro-American elements. If, if Obama had not deserted Mubarak when he did, they would be completely anti-American. So I'm glad he did that. But since that time, and I know you're not necessarily saying that was a bad decision. Since that time, let's recall what the military did. The military, they had, they had a vote to have elections. The elections are to be held today. And then what the military said in one of their communiques, and I think they thought no one would notice, by the way, no matter who you vote for in the parliament, we, the military, will always retain control. Uh, we can fire the prime minister. We can overturn your elections. We can uh, say that uh, anything that the, the law that, that the parliament passes is null and void. The military, in effect, tried a coup, and the people said no. 
And I don't know what the results of elections will be, but if we had supported the military coup, and that's, an, that's what they tried to do, over the will of the Egyptian people, we would have again been on the wrong side of history, we would have again created anti-American sentiment, and of course we'd be on the wrong side of democracy, which I know you don't want to be. No, well, I, I don't want to be. Uh, you again, didn't support the military my, my, after they said that. My, my single wish list here would have been that the president would have shut his yap uh, two days ago when he uh, felt the need to take the world stage and talk about something that would, was best left untalked about. So you would have been fine if the military had kept their communique and said, say you that. know what, if, if, if they elect a prime minister, we're just going to ignore the prime minister. If they elect laws, we can overturn them. I, I read that. They said they could uh, require uh, someone to be there only six months. They, they, had tr they, they retained tremendous power. And I, I don't blame the Egyptian people for fighting back against that. I, I think they're right. Uh, we'll see how it turns out. I have, uh, I have hopes that my worst fears are not realized, but uh, we might. Look, I don't know where it's going to go either, but I, I do know this. But Mark, that's my whole point, is you should know where it's going to go before you choose sides. I mean, you don't, you don't just, it's not like going to Vegas and rolling the dice and say, well, maybe I'll get a seven, maybe I won't. No, you, you know engineer what? these things. You make them happen. No, no. The destiny yes. of the Egyptian people is not for the United States to engineer. I didn't, I know, I didn't uh, say no, the destiny of the Egyptian people. That's what but, you're saying. You're saying we should control every country on earth. Yeah, the no. Egyptian people want a democracy, but no. if they don't handle democracy fully, we'll just put in a, a, a U.S.-sponsored Time. We'll help. And we'll we'll help. We'll that. help guide them in the right direction. That's what I'm saying. Having the military overturn any democratic regulation is I hardly. Didn't, I didn't but that's what the that military not, wanted. I, that's what the Egyptian I'm, military I'm not, tried I'm to not, do. I'm not supporting that for the for the full term. That's not that's not my point. Uh, if we need uh, another six months of heavy-handed military guidance uh, to ensure the country is on the right track, that's not necessarily the, the worst thing in the world. Military guidance included stopping free speech. Right. Uh, it continued uh, beating oh, up people. Oh, and you don't and think and you, and you don't think the uh, Sharia law folks are going to stop uh, free speech? I don't think. And I and I and listen. I could be wrong. And if I'm wrong, I'll admit it right here on this air. I don't think the majority of the Egyptian people want Sharia law. I'm I don't not, think the majority of the Egyptian people will support a theocracy. I will get. I admit the Muslim Brotherhood has support. I would even say they probably have more support than any other single party. Whether that's 25 or 30 percent, I think in Tunisia it was 35 percent. I do not think it's a majority. Uh, I don't know who's going to win the elections. I, like you, hope the Muslim Brotherhood does not get a majority. But I don't think the majority of Egyptian people want that. I could be wrong. Well, but at the end of the day, it's their destiny. And, Mark, I, and, and I, I they, think, get, they get to make that decision, even if I don't like it. I think you're right. Uh, the majority of the Egyptian people don't support that. But the Muslim Brotherhood is the most organized true. And, and the best funded. True, and, both true. And you do disproportionately better in elections if you're organized and funded over the other ones which They're are They're gonna do well. That's the problem. I hope they won't make a majority, but at the end of the day, I just don't think it's our decision to make. I think we gotta leave it up to democracy, even if I don't like the result, even if America doesn't like the result. When we come back, I wanna talk about Syria and the 2012 Republican nominees. Be right back. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Fire. Cause there's nothing very funny about drinking fire. Nothing very nice. Nothing nice. very nice. A homeless man. So if a gorgeous force is what you desire, don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Yeah. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire. Why don't you just wash your car at home? When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go? to protect the planet. I want you to build an ark. Here we go. Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow. Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution.
Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first. Here again, the Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. I'm your host, Mark Levine. My guest today is Mike Lane, Republican strategist. There is still time for you to call in and let us know whether you agree with me or Mike or both of us or neither of us. Just pick up the phone. You can dial toll-free 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275, and give us your two cents. Mike, before I leave the Middle East, I think it's very interesting what's happening in Syria. Um, it's something I've been pushing for a long time. Uh, frankly, I thought uh, President Obama was slow, but I'm glad to hear him. Uh, and he said that President Assad has to go. That was about a month ago or so. And I'm, I got to say, I'm surprised and pleased at the Arab League. I did not think that that group would follow along and be the same with Syria as they were with Libya, because they didn't like Gaddafi. But Assad is, is part of them. Uh, you know, this this group of kings and dictators that, uh, but maybe because Assad is supported by Iran, and, but for whatever reason, I think it's terrific because with their imprimatur, with the Arab League saying that Syria is on the wrong side of history, um, it does a couple things. One thing I think it makes the Arab League be a more responsive organization, actually listening to the, the people of that region, which is great. Assad has killed 3,000 innocent people. It's got to stop. And I think the world is looking at it. At the end of the day, we may end up with uh, sanctions, and maybe even a no-fly zone, and I am just fine with that. I'd like to see Assad go. Mark, in the last segment, we were talking about the timing of things and when is the right time to say something, when is not. And I took exception to the president's most recent comments on Egypt, thinking they were very ill-timed. Uh, you criticize him for being a little bit too slow in Syria. I think he actually played that one exactly right. Uh, he. He waited until the, the mass had built when the, the world stage was waiting for uh, his comment, and he delivered the right comment at the right time. Uh, and I, I think, frankly, I, I say he gets 20% of stuff right. That's one of his 20%. He, he did well on that. Uh, you note correctly that the Arab League movement on, on uh, Assad in Syria uh, is, is it, it, it's surprising, I guess. I, but it's good I, I surprising. Didn't, oh, it's wonderful surprising. Uh, I think I think Assad is going to go. Uh, we have the luxury of time at this point, which is terrific because Assad be... is not just destroying his own people. He re he supports terrorists all across the globe, right, right. Hamas and Hezbollah. He represents a minority, the Alawite. Uh, this is a Shia minority in a Sunni country. The people of Syria should determine their own destiny. A lot of people are afraid of the Syrian future, just like you're afraid of the Egyptian future. But I think in the long run, and it may be a long run, it may not be a short run. In the long run. I think that democratic nations are more likely to keep the peace. I can think of a few examples. Turkey and Greece come to mind where democracies fight, but they tend to fight over other territories like, like Cyprus. Generally, I think democracies are less likely to go to an aggressive war than dictatorships. And so I know there are many supporters of Israel, like myself, who say, you know, hey, uh, let, let the dictators stand. I disagree with them. I'm a big supporter of Israel, but I got to tell you, at the end of the day, I want to see democracy prevail. And, uh, of course, it takes not one election, but two or three before you really know that democracy has prevailed. But uh, I'd like to see it in Syria. And um, I, I say within a year or two, Assad's going to go. And I, I don't think I could have said that just a few months ago. Well, we'll see what happens in Syria. Uh, the, the, the good news is that uh, it, it, it can get a little bit worse, but it can't get a lot worse than Assad. That's true. So, uh, you know, there's, there, one, there's less downside risk to getting rid of a thug like Assad than now, there is uh, Mubarak. There's one more country that's in the throes of revolution. They haven't seen the people out on the street too much lately because they've been beaten down so much. It's actually the first one to have the revolution. Even before Tunisia, it's, of course, Iran, where you had the Green Revolution. Um, it's interesting, uh, I'm a Democrat, you're a Republican. You praised Obama on Syria. Uh, I'm going to condemn Obama on Iran. I don't think he's been tough enough. President Obama ran for election saying Iran will not get nuclear weapons. And he made it very clear that all options are on the table. This is candidate Obama in a debate. And uh, I don't think he's making that so clear right now. Iran, 
on, on according to the latest IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency report, which is a, a UN body, it's separate, it's certainly not a huge friend of the United States, I, I don't have to remind people, they said in Iraq that Iraq did not have weapons of mass destruction, and Bush went to war anyway, so this is hardly a United, Nation, a United States controlled organization. They say Iran is on the path to developing a nuclear weapon, I think they're right. And I think Obama really needs to step up the rhetoric and um, sanctions and possibly even more. And I just haven't seen enough of it. Well, you, uh, you may recall uh, maybe it was uh, 18 months ago when they had the beginnings of the Iranian spring. Uh, the Green the Revolution, States, they called the it. Green Revolution, the, uh, uh, the students took to the street. And I was more critical of the president at that time. I was uh, too. That I thought he did not uh, say enough, that it right. was his obligation uh, to particularly stir the pot uh, with Iran at that particular point in time. He missed that opportunity. He did. So now we're here. Uh, what do we do? I think that uh, not only is the IAEA report uh, profoundly disturbing and scary, uh, but it's it's imminent. I mean, we're talking about within, it could be a, within, year. within a year, certainly within two years, could uh, be. when they will have uh, nuclear weapons capability. Uh, the president did promise during the campaign that uh, there would be uh, no chance that they would get uh, nuclear weapons on his watch. Uh, so he's, he's got to either really now, ratchet up the now sanctions. Now he's, he's tried point. with sanctions. Apparently Russia and China have said they won't, they'll veto anything in the Security Council. Right. He's gotten some sanctions through Europe. Is the only answer going to be military well, action? Well, we, we got a resolution uh, through the IAEA, which, which was funny enough and surprising as, as it is, uh, that uh, we were able to get a resolution through that calling for uh, a more vigorous dialogue with Iran. Well, Iran which, even offered which, which to is, give... Their, which is to say nothing, but what it is, it's the first step. Well, Iran even offered right. to give their, their low enriched uranium to Russia for processing because they claim it's for peaceful purposes. And then uh, Obama, I, to his credit, said, absolutely, it's a deal. And Iran walked off and, right. and said, sorry, right. don't call our bluff again. But, right. but, but what it, is the answer here? Uh, it seems to me... I mean, are there any more sanctions in our quiver other than I'd like to see him go to Europe. I do think there are a few more things Europeans could do if, if President Obama put pressure on him. I'd like to see him do that. In the American quiver, I don't know that there's much more we can do to sanction Iran. Is this going to come to military action? I think it, it very well may. And if it's going to come to military action, better sooner than later, uh, in my estimation. But as we did with Libya, uh, when we couldn't get, you know, the rest of the going, NATO took action. Right. Uh, it may be that but NATO is the answer. Would in, NATO take in Iran. action, Iran? Because I don't see support from Britain, France, we, Germany on, on this one. I don't we, see it. We need. Uh, I, I think maybe France. I, I, no, no. I, maybe I, I, I think the the report that they are within a year or two of developing nuclear weapons is enough to sober anybody. Uh, even uh, well, we'll see. You know. We'll see. One of the interesting things I found uh, that hasn't been discussed a lot is that uh, not only does Israel have bunker buster weapons, everyone's talking about whether Israel will do an attack on Iran, and they might. But we also gave them to the UAE, to the United Arab Emirates, who are no friends of Iran. And I must say, if anyone's going to, to take them out, it'd be great to see uh, an Arab country like UAE take them out. It's less likely to cause a, a wild, yeah, it'd be, a it'd wider be great. conflagration. Uh, so I hope we're helping them do that. Uh, I hope Obama's working covertly. We can't know if he is. But we may well, know. No, we, 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 we may know soon no, enough. We, we know he's working covertly. Yeah, uh, but we we'll, just we just don't know how effective how or effective where he's going. Is. Hopefully, it'll be effective. We only got about five minutes left. Uh, I want to talk about the 2012 campaign. We're going to have a whole show on the campaign. I want to bring you in. I want to bring because now. Is it fair to say that you are endorsing? You're a supporter of Mitt Romney? Is, is that right? I mean, is, is he your guy? You, you know, Mark. You only got so many horses to choose from. Is he your I, horse? You know, I, I, I'm comfortable with almost everyone in the Republican field right now, with the exception of Ron Paul. I, I just think that his comfortable far, with all of them. His, his foreign policy. You're comfortable views, with Herman Cain running uh, for president. You know, I don't think Herman Cain's going to be the nominee. He's not, but, uh, I, but you but just I, said you were comfortable with all of them. I, I, I would, I would enthusiastically support Herman Cain over Barack Obama. Yes, I think that there's no doubt uh, about the fact that he's more qualified than Obama is to be president. However. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I, I have not endorsed uh, Romney yet. I have not done. I think he's more likely uh, than not to be the nominee. Uh, I don't think that the current uh, the current surge uh, from Speaker Gingrich uh, is going to be successful in in derailing. I, I New Gingrich has a I, long I history wrong. and a lot a lot wrong. that he's done to complain uh, about. You know, I, I, I'd be perfectly comfortable with Speaker Gingrich as our nominee. I would enthusiastically support Let me him. Let me ask you this: uh, uh, Virtually everyone has had their 
their spot at the top of the polls at one point or another, Except with two Ron exceptions. <laughs> oh, well, no, no, Ron Paul has almost all has been second a lot of times. Right. He was second in the Iowa straw poll. He always has his 10, 12, sometimes 14%. Right. He's actually more a contender. There are two that always are at the bottom, 1%, 2%. One is Rick Santorum. I don't think anybody likes him. The other one, more interestingly, I think, is John Huntsman. Now, here is a former governor of the state of Utah, a conservative, but a moderate conservative, someone who... Uh, frankly, I think it's more like a Ronald Reagan conservative, because I think most of your parties to the right of Ronald Reagan right now. This is a guy that's getting absolutely no traction. I don't know whether he's 1% or he's, if he's ever gotten to 2%. Your party can't handle moderates anymore. No, no. Here, here's, here's, here's the story on Huntsman. He has found out a hard lesson, uh, as did Perry uh, learn the same hard lesson, and that is that you can't put a, a national political presidential campaign together in 30 days, go out there and be successful. It's just not going to work. Now, Perry caught a wave for about three weeks before his wave before, crashed. Before they learned be, who he be, was. Before his wave crashed. <laughs> Huntsman hasn't been able to catch the wave. You can't put a national Why not? presidential everyone else, campaign everyone else together has been, in 30 days. Everyone else has been atop the polls. You, you uh, might as well give Huntsman uh, a shot may, to, be, may, to be. Maybe, maybe he'll get his shot you know, at <laughs> some point. So. But look, who's, who's run the best campaign and, and who's ahead? It's Romney because he's been doing this for five years. I would say no one has. I think the Republican no. Romney, Party Romney's is, been doing this for five years. And he, yes. It shows. He's got a focused, disciplined message. Yes. Uh, has he, he ever gotten above 25% in any poll? I don't think he has. I, you know, I think the Republican you know, Party. Is, the, the answer is yes, but you know. Maybe 26%. Uh, no, are you talking about the national poll or state by state poll? Either one. Yeah. A national poll. Say four, national four, poll. 42, 46 percent in New Hampshire, yes. Right, let's, let's say a national poll. The reason is, it seems to me that your party is desperately searching for anyone but Romney. Uh, 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 no. Rick Perry, uh, Michelle Bachman, uh, Herman Cain, uh, Newt Gingrich, anyone, anyone but Romney. And the answer is he probably will be your nominee, but it shows that with all the flavors of the month. Show me how desperately your party doesn't no. like Mitt Romney and considers him a massive flip flop. I, you, you know what? I have no problem with flip floppers as long as they're flipping in my direction. There's, there's no Why problem can't with he flip that at back? all. Um, here's, here's the story. Uh, this is a, uh, a long, involved primary process that is actually working out better than anybody anticipated. The number of debates which have given the exposure of the candidates individually as they get to take their turn at the microphone and, and be evaluated by people and, and they get better known and, and they become more popular and less popular and the shifting of things. This is, this is better than anybody could have written in a script for it to work out that way. I'll tell you I'm something. thrilled with the way this is going. You know, you know, I'll tell you three things about Rick Perry, all right? The first is he, everyone thought he was going to be terrific the moment he got in. Not me. Number two, the moment he opened <laughs> his mouth, he lost all credit by the Republican Party. And the third thing is... That's very funny, Mark. Except Oops. for the fact, except Oops. for the fact that no, he has not what lost credibility. What was the third thing? Uh, Rick Perry. <laughs> Rick, Rick Perry, if he gets the nomination. Rick Perry's a national joke. Rick, Rick Perry, if he gets the nomination, will make a fine candidate. And he'll make a fine president. I don't believe he's going to get the nomination. I don't believe he's. We're gonna uh, have to do a to show be. entirely on the 2012 Republican nominees, and I'll bring in another Republican guest who disagrees with Mike Lane. Stay tuned for that. If you want to find out more about the Inside Scoop, just go to RadioInsideScoop.com or check out MarkLevine.tv. And you can leave a comment on tonight's show or watch any other fine shows we've done. Mike Lane, thank you very much for coming here on the Inside Scoop. Thanks for having me, Mark. Again, my apologies for the dress, folks. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving.